One of the most important things to me when creating Spider-Man was to give him some motivation. I mean, I've often thought, if I had a superpower, would I spend my life fighting criminals, risking my life that way? I'd probably try to make some money with my power, you know, go, go into show business or something. So I had to figure out, why does Spider-Man do it? And that's why, in the beginning, I sort of tried to structure the story so that he would feel responsible for the death of his uncle. I don't know if you remember that part, but um, he had let a burglar escape when he could have caught him if, after he first became Spider-Man. And later on, he came home and he found his uncle dead. And he, well, his uncle was like his father to him because he didn't have a mother and father. He just lived with his aunt and uncle. This tore him up so much that he had to go after the killer. And he found him. And he was astonished to learn the man who killed his uncle was the burglar whom he had let escape. <clears throat> and he, he said to himself, if I had only done my duty, if I had caught that fella, if I had stopped him, my uncle would be alive today. So he had this tremendous feeling of responsibility. In fact, I even wrote that line, with great power comes great responsibility. And that's the reason <clears throat> to make up for what happened to his uncle. He feels he's got to use his power for good. I have been asked how come when the villain seems to be killed off, he suddenly appears later on in other stories. Well, if you think about it, it's only logic. If you're a writer and you create a really good villain, <clears throat> you don't want to see the last of them. The readers get to like those villains. So you write the story so that it may seem as though you've killed the villain off, but you always leave them some little way to have survived. And that's what we do. Take someone like the Green Goblin. He's just too good to kill, you know? And the same with Doc Ock or Sandman or the Vulture or any of them. So um, we have one hero that we use all the time. And we can't create a new villain every day for every new story, so we do recycle them. And, and the thing is, most of the readers are happy about it because it's like the return of an old friend to them. One of the most unique things about Spider-Man is he has all of these self-doubts and all of these feelings that in some way he's jeopardizing the safety of the people who are closest to him because as soon as some deadly villain learns that Spider-Man cares about someone else, obviously that villain will try to capture that someone else and use that someone as bait to trap Spider-Man or to threaten Spider-Man with. So he's always conscious of the fact that he has to be very careful and he has to be very protective of those who are near and dear to him. And he also has to try not to let people know that they are important to Spider-Man. So unlike most superheroes, he doesn't just go out and fight the bad guys and have a good time. He's always got these heavy problems on his mind. And I think, I, I really think that's one of the things that makes him rather interesting. One story that I'm rather proud of because of its originality is the story where it isn't Spider-Man really who saves Robbie Robinson from being framed, but it's Peter Parker. Now, of course, you may rightfully say, hey, Spider-Man is Peter Parker, and I'll have to agree. But the point is, we showed that Spider-Man, using the intelligence, the brain, the skills, the ideas, 
the reasoning ability of Peter Parker is able to save Robbie. It didn't require super strength or super speed or web swinging. And I like to have stories like that occasionally to show that an average human being can also be a great force for good and can do wonderful things if he really tries and thinks clearly. Perhaps one of the things we always tried to do in the Spider-Man stories was have a little psychology, treat people as though they're really interesting and unpredictable human beings. I think in this particular story, where Norman Osborn's son, Harry, tries to become and does become the Green Goblin, and his father, who was the original Green Goblin, gets a little spacey. Um, we were trying to show how strange events can affect people and, and how sometimes people act in an irrational way. And the most important thing to us in our stories is to give you, the reader, a whole group of characters who all act differently, just the way in real life you take a lot of people and no two of them will ever act the same. And that's why we have a Norman Osborn, who's a wealthy, successful businessman, but he still has, has a screw loose up here somehow. And, and his son, who really isn't as bad as Norman, but wants so badly to impress his father that he goes off the deep end and he's willing to do something bad to impress his father, which of course he should not do. And we hope that's, that it's obvious to the viewer that these are people who are somewhat mentally disturbed. And they're certainly not characters to emulate or to imitate. I can't tell you what a thrill it was to see these characters that I had been writing for so many years and working with, with artists on, and we were looking at the drawings on sheets of illustration board, and then we would see them in the magazines, and we'd read the story panel by panel, illustration by illustration, and suddenly all that changed. Suddenly, we saw that on the screen, and the characters moved, and we heard their voices, and it was as though they had become alive. And when I saw that first cartoon, oh man, it was like one of the biggest thrills of my life. There were all the characters I had been writing about and the artists had been drawing, and there they were, moving just like, just like any person, you know? And, and I heard them, and it was like watching a movie, any movie. Oh, it was better than a movie because these were my characters. Of course, when I was younger, there were so many things I wanted to do. I think the first one, I wanted to be an actor. I think that's why I like doing things like this, because I'm talking to people. I love talking to people. Um, well, in those days, you couldn't, I couldn't make enough money as an actor. I did a little acting, but it didn't pay that well. I also wanted to be in the advertising business. I love ads. When I read a magazine, I usually spend as much time reading the advertisements as whatever the magazine has. Then I thought, I, when I was very young, I wanted to be a lawyer, because I had gone to a movie. Oh, I must have been about 10 years old. And there was one scene with a lawyer, and he was speaking so beautifully, and he was swaying the jury, and everybody thought he was so wonderful. And I thought, boy, it must be great to be able to get up there in front of a jury and have somebody set free or, or convicted if you're the DA. I didn't realize that the talking you do is the least of it. Most of it is paperwork and studying. So I didn't become a lawyer. And um, I wanted, I, when I was very young, I wanted to be the usual, a policeman, a fireman, a cowboy. I, everything, the whole world seemed exciting to me. And I've got to tell you, it still does. 
You know, it's a funny thing. Today, comic book writers get really a lot of respect because people know that so many motion pictures are based on what they're writing. But boy, was it different years ago when I started. Nobody, nobody cared about comic books. Nobody had any respect for them. I remember I'd go to a cocktail party, let's say, with my wife, and somebody would walk over to me, a stranger, and he'd say, what do you do? Boy, I knew it was coming. I'd say, oh, I'm a writer, and I tried to walk away, but he'd follow me and, oh, what do you write? I still try to avoid the ultimate outcome, and I would say, oh, I, I, I write magazine stories. Kept walking away, kept following me. Well, what kind of magazine stories? For what magazines? At some point, I had to say comic books. Immediately, the interest ended. The guy would turn around, walk in the other direction. Of course, now it's totally different. Now it's, um, excuse me, Tom Cruise. I think that's Stan Lee over there. I've got to talk to him. He writes comic books. <laughs> I'm only kidding. <laughs> I think the one bit of advice that I would give anybody who wants to get into the comic book business as a writer would be, don't try to just write comics. The most important thing is be a good writer and then try to write comics. But you've got to know characterization. You've got to be able to describe things well. You've got to understand plotting. You've got to understand how to maintain a reader's interest, how to keep up the suspense. You've got to understand pacing. Now, all those things apply whether you're writing a novel, a motion picture, a television series, a comic book. So don't just concentrate on comics. First learn the craft of writing and then try to do comics. Same thing applies to artists. First become a really good artist. Learn perspective, learn layout, anatomy, learn how to move the figure. As a matter of fact, being a comic book artist is probably the most difficult type of artwork there is because you have to be able to draw everything. Uh, as a comic book artist, one story may deal with aliens on another planet and you've got to draw them so they look believable. At least the reader must think they're aliens on another planet. You may have to draw another story that takes place in a subway, on a bridge, in an airport, in a gambling casino, in Paris, in Shanghai. I mean, you've got to be able to draw everything and anything. Most of the comic book artists I know started when they were very young and they carried a sketchbook with them. And wherever they were, they would sketch the places they were at, they would sketch the people passing by, they'd sketch anything that looked interesting. I have the greatest, the utmost respect for comic book artists because they have to be so incredibly talented to really do a good job. I couldn't keep an artist standing around with nothing to do, but I couldn't stop what I was doing and write a different script. So I would say, look, Jack, I tell you what, I can't write the whole script, but here's the story that I want to tell. And I would describe the story in a couple of minutes. I'd say, you go home and draw it any way you want. When you bring in the artwork, I'll fill in the dialogue and the captions. And then I would do that for John Romita or for John Buscema or for Gene Colan or Gil Kane. And that way, I could keep a lot of artists busy at the same time. Then when they brought the artwork in, I had it lying on a table in front of me, and all I had to do was put in the dialogue and the captions. Now, I don't want to make that sound too easy, because to me, putting in the dialogue is one of the most important things. That's what gives you the characterization. But it's a lot easier to do that than to sit and write a full script. So that was my little trick. And in that way, we were able to turn out a lot of magazines every month. Those artists were the equivalent of directors of photography, layout men, and even 
associate writers because what they would do, I'd give them the idea for the story, but then they told the story in their own way. So they understood pacing, they understood how to give so much space to the beginning, the middle, the end, how to keep the suspense going. They threw a lot of ideas in that I hadn't even given them. And that made it fun for me, because when I was putting in the copy, very often I'd see some drawings and I didn't even know what they were. But I had to figure out a way to make sense of them. It was almost like doing a crossword puzzle. And I think that's what kept my interest up all the time. I never could get bored because I never knew what to expect when the artwork came in. And I found it always very challenging and I love puzzles, so it was a lot of fun. <laughs> A lot of people ask me, why am I still working this hard and why don't I retire? <clears throat> well, I've often, if you think about it, I've often thought, when you retire, you usually say to yourself, at last, I don't have to do that work anymore. Now I can do what I've always wanted to do. Well, the thing is, I'm doing what I've always wanted to do. I'm writing stories. I'm sort of out of the comic book business for the most part, and I'm working on movies and television now. But I'm working with other screenwriters, I'm working with directors, with producers, I'm coming up with ideas for movies, for television series. I've never had more fun. If I were retired, I'd be wanting to do what I'm doing now. I'm lucky enough to be doing it, I don't have to want to. You know, I think a great villain needs the same characteristics as a great hero. A, he has to be somewhat believable. He has to act credibly and always stay in character. B, he has to be colorful. If he's just a guy who's a litter bug or a jaywalker, you're not going to care. So there has to be some sort of a colorful crime that he wants to execute, and hopefully he wants to execute the crime in some colorful way. It helps if he has a very unique superpower. As with heroes, you want to give him a great personality. Um, every character you write about, whether a hero or a villain or an incidental character, you want to try to make them as interesting, as colorful, as different as possible. It doesn't hurt occasionally to build a little pathos for the villain into the story, where you might even feel a little sorry for him when he meets his untimely or perhaps his timely end. By the same token, you never want to build too much sympathy for the villain. I never want to make the mistake of making the villain seem nicer or more glamorous than the hero. You never want the reader to feel, gee, I wish I was like the villain, because then I think you're doing a, a disservice to mankind writing those kind of stories. I, I would hope every story I've ever written would make the reader want to be the hero and not the villain. If you have a masked villain running through a number of episodes and then you unmask him, should it be somebody that we've seen before or should he end up being a perfect stranger? In a story, I think a reader would be cheated if the villain turned out to be a character that had never appeared in the story before. Even though most of the villains have colorful costumes or they may wear masks, um, in their normal identity, they look fairly much like regular people. You know, they're not monstrous looking. And I think the reason that we always tried to do that is because in real life, most bad people are just, they look like ordinary people. That's what they are. They're ordinary people who went bad. And again, I, I don't think they'd be credible enough if they were all misshapen, ugly, monstrous type of people. Lots of people wonder, which is the best way really to tell a superhero story? Using comic books or through the motion picture? Well, 
both of them have advantages and disadvantages. Obviously, the disadvantage of a comic book is that you can't hear the voices. You can't see the people move. But the disadvantage of the movie, um, and you may never have thought of this, you can't see the thought balloons. And when I used to write the comics, I went crazy with thought balloons. I would try to put as many thought bubbles in as I could, because I liked the reader to know what the character is thinking. If you know what a character is thinking most of the time, you get to know that character better. You understand him, and you can relate to him or her. In a movie, you can't constantly have a character talking to himself. You can't show little bubbles above his head. So it's up to the actor, by his facial expressions and his body language, to try to depict what his feelings are. My two favorite villains for Spider-Man were Doc Ock and the Green Goblin. I figured that they gave him more trouble than almost anybody. Doc Ock with those tentacles of his that could, he could um, extend them and use them to go to a third floor window if he had to. He could wrap them around Spider-Man and crush him. He could use them as weapons. And he was the usual mad scientist. I love mad scientists. I think if not for mad scientists, I wouldn't be able to write any stories. And then, of course, there was the Green Goblin. I always loved him because he was a Jekyll and Hyde character. He was this great businessman, this industrialist. He was also a mad villain who could fly on that goblin glider and drop those pumpkin bombs. And Although I must admit I loved them all. I loved the Sandman. I loved the Kingpin. I loved... Uh, I mean, every, as I may have mentioned, I'm my biggest fan. I, I, I love everything I've written. <laughs>